حدثنا عبد الله بن عبد الرحمن حدثنا روح بن أسلم أبو حاتم البصري حدثنا حماد بن السلمة أنبأنا ثابتا عن أنس رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لقد أخفت في الله وما يخاف أحد ولقد أذيت في الله وما يؤذى أحد ولقد أتت علي ثلاثون من بين ليلة من بين ليلة ويوم ومالي ولا بل بلال طعام يأكله ذو كبد إلا شيء يواري إبط بلال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he says that no one in the history of mankind was given as much as pain and was tried and tested as much as I was. We know the story of, and I'm not going to go into details, we know the story of Taif. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to a whole city and they stoned him. He went to go and give da'wah, they stoned him. And as Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is leaving from the city, Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam comes. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, you see these two mountains, the whole city of Taif rests between these two mountains. Ya Rasulullah, give the word and we shall crush the city of Taif and no one from them will ever breathe again. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Jibreel, with my du'as, you're willing to destroy Taif? He said, yes, of course, Ya Rasulullah, we'll crush them. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if my du'a, you're willing to destroy them, then I do du'a, then may Allah guide them. May Allah guide them and may Allah change their ways. Maybe one person amongst them might bring Iman. And today we know the whole Taif is Muslim now. Number two. Two days ago was the event of Mi'raj. There's only two prophets. Well, there's very few individuals, but generally it's about two prophets. If you include Idris Alayhi Salaam would be the third prophet, whose miracles were heavenly miracles. Everyone else's miracles were generally earthly miracles. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Isa Alayhi Salaam, Idris Alayhi Salaam. Most prophets, their miracles were not heavenly miracles. They were very earthly miracles. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his miracle was Mi'raj. He ascended to the highest level to Sidrat al-Muntaha. And he conversed with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And there was a reason for giving him this miracle. It was because he was, his esteem and the pressure and the difficulties on him made, his, made it so difficult and so low that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala raised him to the highest pedestal to combat it. Going on, Bawu Maja fi Sinni Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How old was Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Let's see if anyone knows the correct age of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet? Yeah, Prophet. Yes. How old was it? Sixty-three. 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 Sixty-one. And there's a reason why I'm saying no. How old was he when he, what's the context, or is that? How old was he when he passed away? Not much to context okay, to he that. he passed away, okay. I, I wasn't clear on the question, but I agree with that too much. <laughs> Anyone else? 63? Is that a trick question? 61. Because you are talking about solar years. Mm. 63 lunar years, 61 solar years, 61 solar years, and 63 lunar years. See, if you were thinking of lunar years, I would have said, okay, but <laughs> even when I studied 63 years all my life, I thought it was solar years too. Uh. So, inshallah, I'll reach 63 years of age. <laughs> One person came up, inshallah. <laughs> There are many ahadith in this chapter because of so much work we have to do. I'm not going to go into detail, but I'll mention one hadith of Tirmidhi. But respect, if you don't mind, just put your foot down. It's because the Kitab of Shaman is right there. Abdullah bin Abbas al Dilarnu and Rasulullah were close in age. So someone asked, Man Akbar min kuma? Who's bigger? So he said, Akbar kana Rasulullah. Bigger it was Rasulullah. Bas ana walidtu thalata sirin min qabr. Just I was, it just, I just had the opportunity of being born three years before him, but you know what, he was bigger though. <laughs> the adab, the etiquette, and I spoke on this in Majid Hamza, and I don't want to go into too much details, but Rasulullah, there's other hadith that say Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi passed away at the age of 65, some say passed away, passed away at the age of 60, these are the Sahaba rounding up or rounding down, two, two ways. Babu ma jafi wafati Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Anas bin Malik says, Akhiru nadratin, nadartuha ila Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kashfu satarati yawm al-ithnayn, fa nadartu ila wajhihi ka'annahu warqatu mushafin, wa al-nasu khalfa abi bakrin, fa ashara ila al-nasi anithbutu, wa u bakrin ya ummuhum wa alqa al-sajif, wa tuwafi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in akhri thalika al-yawm. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fell sick two weeks before he passed away. He passed away on a Monday, and he was buried on a Tuesday. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he fell sick, he says that I felt the poison that was poisoned to me in Khaybar. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa went to Khaybar, there was a Jewish woman who had fed him some meat. And the meat said to him that, Ya Rasulullah, I am poisoned. But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa still ate it. And Allah sees the effect of poison and kept it until the time Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. So that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa would get the ni'mat of shahada as well. He would get the ni'mat of martyrdom as well. And he says that I start feeling sick and I'm starting to feel weak. And he started fainting. So he ordered Muru Aba Bakrin an Yaumun Nas. Tell Abu Bakr to lead Salah. So Aisha radiallahu anha at that time she realized that if Abu Bakr starts leading Salah and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passes away in this situation, then everyone's gonna say that look, Abu Bakr was on the Musalla, he passed away, and people are gonna have jealousy and so she wanted to stay away from the Khilafat. And there's a very, very long discussion. She kept on saying, Ya Rasulullah, my father has a soft heart. When he starts praying Salah, he won't be able to control himself and contain himself. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Muru Abu Bakr, tell Abu Bakr to do it. And she kept on saying, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, listen, I'm telling you, tell Abu Bakr to do it. And there's a very lengthy discussion on the demise of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyhow, Abu Bakr the Allah, who begins to lead Salah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam orders, there were different windows that were open into Majd al-Nabwi. He ordered that every window must be closed besides the window of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. These were small indications towards the Khilafat. Mm. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu the Rahman ibn Abi Bakr. He was going to officially announce Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu as the Khalifa. But then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam retracted. And he said, I'm not going to announce them. Why? It's because Abu Nas illa ayyakbal Abu Bakr. People will not accept anyone but Abu Bakr. And there's hikmat behind why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not appoint his successor. Because had Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appointed a successor, then there would be two things that would become necessary for us. Number one, the establishment of an Islamic government. It would become fard. Meaning that without the establishment of Islamic government, you cannot exist. Because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept this, according to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, in Sunni Islam, an establishment of Khilafah or an Islamic government is not a tenet of deen. Yes, we should establish an Islamic government. There should be a Khilafah. That is there. But we're talking about, is it from the tenets of deen? Is it like the five pillars of Islam? And according to uh, the Shia faith, in there, it is a tenet of faith. It is a part of religion. And that is why they call Abu Bakr and all the Sahaba Kafir because they say that, oh, it was a tenet of faith. This is a discussion for another time. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and the second thing would be that after one successor, he would have to appoint the next successor. It would be confirmed on him. That is why Nabi Sallallahu never appointed a successor. Abu Bakr anhu appointed a successor, Umar anhu. When Umar anhu was passing away, they asked him, will you appoint a successor or will you not? So he did both. He appointed six individuals. So he appointed, similar to Abu Bakr anhu, he appointed a group of individuals. But like Rasulullah Sallallahu he didn't pick one of them. And he picked the remaining Ashara Mubashar. Besides one of them because they were in battle. And he said, my son Abdullah bin Umar cannot ascend to the Khilafah. Yes, if they cannot decide amongst themselves, then he will be the individual who will be the final casting vote. But subhanAllah, that's a whole different story of how each one of them moved back, moved back. Today we all want to vie for positions. Vote for me, vote for me. I want to run for this office. The Sahaba, they were individuals. They retracted. Abu Bakr anhu who says, Wallahi, never in my heart. Forget about openly. He says, in my heart, the thought of Khilafat never came. The desire of Khilafat never came. I never did draw for it. I never wanted a position. Yesterday, someone came to me, and they spoke about Imam al Islam Marana over here, that in my own masjid, in my own madrasa, Dr. Sahib is over here, he knows, I never liked leading Salah. I never liked, because that is the Musalla of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone kissed, came and asked me the opinion, they said, oh, if someone sells pork or something, can they lead Tarawi? And I said, listen, one thing is, can they? One thing is, should they? Mm. And listen, what Jama'ah says, behind any sinner, any pious person, you can pray Salah. And if you can't look at the Imam and say, oh, look, the Imam, his beard is cut, okay, you know what, I'm not praying Salah behind him, walk away. No, no, no. Salat kulli, min aqaid, ahli sinna wal Jama'ah, as-salatu kulli khalfi, 
birrir wa fajir. Doesn't matter how the individual is, salah behind him is jais. The next second thing is, should that person be an imam? You are, con you are holding on to the direct wiratha, the inheritance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's not a small thing. This was the direct job of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all of his life, to lead the salah. No one led Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in salah besides one sahabi, Abdurrahman bin Auf. As Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going, one day he got late for salah. And Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu anhu was leading salah. Now as Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approached, the sahaba started making noise. Nabi moves back, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, continue. And he completed the salah. He's the only sahabi amongst the galaxy of sahaba that led Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in salah. Now, the second one was Abu Bakr Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got there in his sickness. Abu Bakr saw him and started moving back. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, no, 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 no. He stayed back. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling him, no, 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 no. He moves back. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam completed his salah. According to this, the scholars deduce two notions. One is Al-Amru Fawq Al-Adab Wal Adabu Fawq Al-Amr If someone tells you to do something, should you do it or not? Should you have respect or should you not have it? Or should you listen to their order or should you have respect for them? For example, I come here and I say, Nadir, sit on my seat. Now, should Nadir come and sit on my seat or should he not sit on my seat? Are you coming to sit on my seat? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to Nadir, by the way. But if I say, Nadir, come and sit on my seat. Now, should he sit on my seat or should he not sit on my seat? Al-Amru Fawq Al-Adab Abdurrahman bin Auf did that. He said the adab was Nabi Sallallahu should lead salah. But the hukum came, the, you continue. So now I must do what the hukum is. And I must not do what respect is because listening to um, disobeying the hukum would be disrespecting Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Amr fawq al-adab. Amr above adab. Hmm. Abdurrahman bin Auf did that. Abu Bakr al did the opposite. He did al-adab fawq al-amr. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, go ahead. He said, yeah, Rasul, I can't. He said, go ahead. He said, no, 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 no. He said, go ahead. Abu Bakr Zaran did it because there's different relationships people had. One is the relationship of Abdurrahman bin Auf with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's an arm relationship. Nabi Sallallahu said, okay, you have to listen. Abu Bakr's relationship was very close to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that relationship, Ya Rasulullah, I'm too close to you. I understand them. I understand everything else. Whatever happens, Ya Rasulullah, I cannot lead you in Salah. There's no way I can do it. So there are two ways we learn from both people's angles. So going on, Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes. There are many many incidents that took place. Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I don't want to go to the different discussions because you tap one, you have a plethora of discussions that will take place. As the end of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam's days came by, even in the most tired form he was, and he was fainting, and he couldn't stand up, he kept on asking one thing. Is it the time of Salah? Is it the time of Salah? He would faint and he would get up and say, is it the time of Salah? That's all. And in the final moments, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uncovered, he cannot get up properly, but he uncovers the cloth and he says, I want to see my Ummah. In the final moments as well, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cares about you and I. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ascending to Mi'raj. He's at the highest level of Mi'raj. He speaks to Allah. Yes, this narration is very debatable and there's discussion on it, but you can use weak narrations in Fama'i. He has a conversation with Allah. He says, At-tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa You know, you always wonder what is tahiyyat? This was a conversation, according to one narration. Weak, but khair, it's a narration, it's a narration. At-tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibat. He said, Ya Allah, at-tahiyyat. Tahiyyat mean all qawli ibadat, all spoken ibadat. Ya Allah, this is for you. Wa salawat. Salawat is badani ibadat. Ya Allah, all bodily ibadat is for you. Wa tayyibat. Tayyibat is mali ibadat. Ya Allah, all monetary ibadat is for you. Allah says, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Imagine talking to Rabbul Alameen. You're talking to Rabbul Alameen and Rabbul Alameen directly can hear the voice of Rabbul Alameen. The tajalli of Rabbul Alameen is saying Muslim, Nurun Ra'ani. Nuraniyun ra'ahu. There's two ways you can read this. Nurun anna ra'ahu or Nuraniyun ra'ahu. There's different opinion. Did he see Allah? Did he not? Scholars who say that he saw Allah, they say Nuraniyun ra'ahu. It was Nur that he saw. Those who say he didn't see Allah, they say Nurun anna ra'ahu. He's Nur, how can he see it? There's a difference in the Sahaba. This was a, there's a lot of the differences that stem, the diff they stem from the Sahaba. Did they did see or not? There's a difference in the Sahaba. Allah knows. We'll go with the opinion that Nabi Sallallahu did see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Musa could see it, a speck of it, then why can Nabi Sallallahu not see it? 
This is a preferred opinion. The Nabi saw some did see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Mi'raj. Nurani wa ra'ahu. So when he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever tajalli form he saw Allah, the way Allah, the way Allah knows best. And he's talking to Allah. Attahiyatullah. As-salamu alaykum, As-salamu alaykum, ayyuhan Nabi. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Allah, salam on me. Wa ala ibadillahi salihin. And on my ummat as well. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you're sending peace on me, Ya Allah. But I have an ummah here and I care for them as well. Ya Allah, send salam upon them as well. People ask you and I, do dua for me, do dua for me. If you want to be in the dua of every single person and every single salah, become pious, become from ibadullah salihin, become from the sulaha, become from the virtuous, and automatically you will be entered in every individual salah and dua. You don't have to ask anyone to for dua. We go, Shaykh, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm with your dua, I'm doing good. That guy's never done dua for him in his entire life. <laughs> he really does dua for himself. Where is he going to do dua for you? But it's, it's the thing. Didi, I'm doing dua. You know, with your duas, I'm doing good. And no one does dua for anybody these days. I'm really get time to do dua for myself. Where do I got to do dua for you? I was talking to one of my friends in Cape. Uh, they're from England. So we went to someone's house in Cape Town, and they were so touched by their uh, hospitality. So my friend, uh, they were like, oh, you know, we're going to do du'a, we're going to do du'a for you all the time. And every one of our du'as, we're going to do du'a for you all the time. And after they finished the du'a, I was like, really? I was like, you barely do du'a for yourself. They're like, I know, but that means that whenever I remember them, I will do du'a for them. <laughs> I was like, mashallah, I like your tawi. <laughs> so afterwards, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the house, he was at the house of Maimuna radiallahu anha, and he was going to the different wives' homes, and he kept on asking, when is Aisha's turn? When is Aisha's turn? When is Aisha's turn? And they realized, they said, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spend the final moments at the house of Aisha. So they all gave up their days. And they said, go to the house of Aisha. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the house of Aisha. And she's taking care of him. SubhanAllah. She's taking care of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the story is long. Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr radiallahu anhu comes. And I'm going to skip fast tracking so we can finish this. Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr comes. And there's a miswak in his pocket. And Rasulullah begins looking at the miswak. Small, small sunnahs we miss in our lives. Small, you see, Allah doesn't need to look at the biggest things that we do. Sometimes it's the smallest things that we do. That Allah sees us and forgives us. Imam Muhammad Shaybani rahimahullah comes about him and about many scholars as well. These were tremendous individuals who compiled many fiqh books and have done a great ihsan on the ummah, their academia and their knowledge and whatnot. But after, when they passed away in their dreams, someone saw them and said, how did Allah fare with you? He said, Allah didn't look at anything I did. One day I was writing my pen, with my pen, and there was a fly that came in to drink the ink. And I let the fly fill its stomach and then move. I didn't disturb the fly. Allah liked that so much, he forgave all my sins. <laughs> Imam Shafi, the mother of Imam Shafi, we hear of Imam Shafi, the giant. Who, there's a scholar of the caliber of Imam Shafi. After he passed away, someone asked him, that how did Allah fare with you? He said, Allah didn't look at anything I did. The only thing Allah forgave me for was one thing. I compiled a durood that no one before me ever compiled. And I used to do this durood, and because of that durood, Allah forgave me. The durood was, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad kullama dhakarahu dhakirun wa kullama ghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafilun. Oh my Allah, send salutations on Rasulullah every time someone remembers him and every time someone forgets him. It was just a small thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the Shafi, I'll forgive you. Rahmat rabbaha nami joyyad. Rahmat rabbaha nami joyyad. The mercy of Allah looks for an excuse. He doesn't have a price to it. Small actions, too, even if it's a small action. You see, the Sahaba didn't do large actions. But they did small things, but it was coupled with sincerity. And sometimes it's the smallest things that we do that have sincerity in it. Going on. It was just the miswat. And again, I advise you guys, use, use these small things. You never know. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that from the benefits of miswak, there were 70 benefits. From the benefits of miswak, a person will say the kalima at the time of their death. My teacher, Mufti Muhammad Ali, used to say, what does this mean? He used to say that this means that a person doing miswak, Allah will give him hidayah by this one sunnah to do a thousand more sunnahs. Therefore, he will live his way, the Islamic way, therefore he will die with the kalima on his time. It's one small sunnah that will change your life. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees this miswak. Hazrat Shaykh Muna Zakari, Alhamdulillah Ali, comes about him as well. He had no teeth in his final days. But still, he wanted the miswak done. No teeth, but still the miswak. These elders, they looked after every, every sunnah. People like us, hamku sunnah na kuch karnai. Sunnah to nay sunnah hamku. That's what we do. The sahaba did the sunnah because it was a sunnah. We leave the sunnah because it is a sunnah. The pious not follow. It's only sunnah, right? You don't have to do it. The sahaba said, oh, it's a sunnah. I must do it because it's a sunnah. 
So he goes on to say, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi looked at Abdul Rahman bin Abi Bakr and he's looking at it. Aisha radiallahu understood what he wanted. She grabs the miswab and she uses her saliva to soften the bristles. And she puts it and she does it in Rasulullah's mouth. The last thing to enter the Prophet's mouth was a miswab. And the last thing was the saliva of Aisha radiallahu The saliva of your spouse. This is, creates love. If you have fights at home, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, giving a luqma of food to your wife in his mouth, this is sadaqah. Do these things at home and you'll see the relationship change. You'll be like, no, I'm going to touch my wife. No, it's a sunnah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it's sunnah. There's a reason why we have problems in our homes, because we have culture in our homes, not sunnah in our homes. Small things, imagine if you, you know, I told one of my friends, he took the, he said, okay, I'll do it. You know, his wife was also, mashallah, two steps ahead of him. So, yeah, yeah, I'll do it too. She grabbed me, she pushed the food in his face. <laughs> I was like, this is not what I meant, but uh, <laughs> okay. He was like, yeah, he said, you told us that uh, you should feed our wife. My wife came home and she was angry with me and she just <laughs> put the food on my face like that. No, it, it creates love. You're drinking from the same cup as your spouse. It creates muhabba. Eating with the same utensil. It creates muhabba. It creates love between one another. And this love you need it because it will last you an entire lifetime. It will, it, it, it will affect you, your children, it will affect your family. So going on. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after using the miswak, his, his head is between the chest of Aisha al and underneath the chin of Rasulullah, underneath her chin. And it's resting there. Jibreel alayhi salam comes and says, Ya Rasulullah, Malik al Maut is here. And he's standing outside your house. Never before has he asked every, anyone permission to end, uh, anyone permission before taking their soul. And never after you will he ever ask anyone permission. Ya Rasulullah, if you grant Malik al Mawat, this was the Nabi of Allah, that even the angel of death must need permission to enter his house. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if you give us permission, the Malik al Mawat will enter. And when you live a life like Rasulullah, then you embrace death like Rasulullah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, let Malik al Maut enter. As he enters, yes, the dunya enjoyed Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but how much longer must we ask Jannah to wait for Rasulullah as well? The Jannah has a haq on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allahumma rafiq al ala He kept on saying, Allah is my best friend. Aisha radiallahu anha understood that by this Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not stay amongst us longer. There's a whole situation. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and gave a khutbah. These are very, very long and detailed discussions. But, Allahumma rafiqul a'la. That's all he came and he said. And these were the last words Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when he passed away. There's hikmah behind this too. Now, so many times someone passes away and they don't see the kalima before they pass away. And we start saying, oh, this person didn't say the kalima. The person said this. Did you, did you see the kalima? We see their lips moving like, oh yeah, they probably said the kalima. You know, we, we want to make ourselves believe these things. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself didn't say the kalima. There's a hikmah behind it. Why? It's because a person saying anything good at the time of death is considered like saying the kalima. Mm. Whether you say tasbih, whether you're in sajda, whether you're whatever, it doesn't matter. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah SWT makes these small things so that people don't have bad guman, bad thoughts of anyone else. Small, small things. Anyhow, Rasulullah Sallallahu passes away. As the Nabi of Allah passes away, there is a ruckus amongst the Sahaba. They say that the most brightest day in Medina was the day Nabi of Allah walked in. That's why they call it Munawwara. Medina to Munawwara. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because it was the day the nur spread. And they said the darkest day ever in Medina was the day the soul of Rasulullah left his body. Was the demise of Rasulullah They were in a state of bewilderment. Umar bin al-Khattab came out. He took out his sword and he said, Man kana yaqul anna Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qad maat fa'adribu unaqahu Say that Prophet of Allah has died and I will sever your head from your body. I will chop your head off right now. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't die. He did what Musa alayhi wa sallam did with Bani Israel. He's gone to Allah to converse. He'll be back. They couldn't believe Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passing away. We cannot take it when our, one of our family members passes away. Imagine the man that gave you iman. Imagine the man that saved you from the fire of Jahannam. And at this time, that situation was so tense, the Sahaba started going to Abu Bakr al crying. He understood. He said, Allah is taking you. Allah is taking Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, yes, Allah is taking you. The Sahaba understood from before. When Surah Nasr was revealed, was, this was amongst the last surahs revealed. When it was revealed, the Sahaba already understood that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pass away. Why? إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ the, 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 the mission of the Prophet was to bring Iman to everyone else. So Allah says, when the help of Allah comes and conquest comes. 
وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدَخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Your job is to take this message to the masses. And when you see, Allah says, رَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدَخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا You will see multitudes of people coming inside. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Allah says, do tasbih and do istighfar. Innahu kana tawwaba. Allah accepts tawbah. Oh Muhammad al-Arabi, your mission in the dunya is done. Now worry about your akhirah because you will meet me. Do your own khususi a'mal. Do your own personal a'mal because you will meet me. Innahu kana tawwaba has two meanings to it. One thing is tawwaba meaning Allah accepts tawbah. Allah accepts. Another thing is tawbah means raja' yarji'u. To go back. Innahu kana tawwaba, it is the one that you go back towards. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes. And he said words. First thing he did, he said, مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدًا فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ قَدْ مَاتْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ Whoever worships Muhammad, let him know that Muhammad has passed on. And whoever worships Allah, let him know that Allah is everlasting. Then he went to the forehead of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he kissed the blessed forehead. And he said, Tibata hayyan wa mayyitan, ya Rasulallah. He said, Nabi of Allah, you were beautiful while you were alive. And even in this state, you were even more beautiful. Tibata hayyan wa mayyitan, ya Rasulallah. A disagreement happened. Where will the body of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be buried? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr radiallahu alayhi wa says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the soul of the prophets where he desires that they should be buried. So she will be buried in the house of Aisha of Yalarnha. And it is so, subhanAllah, the house of Aisha of Yalarnha was adjacent to the first Saf. And over there, there was space for four graves. Three graves. After the grave of Rasulullah said, This was how small the house was. The house was just big enough that when Nabi Sallallahu used to pray, he had to touch the feet of Aisha so she would retract it. This is the, what the Hanafis use as an evidence why touching a woman does not break your wudu. So when Nabi Sallallahu would be praying, would touch Aisha of Yalarnha, and she would, Shafi said, if you touch a woman, your wudu breaks. Hanafi said, your wudu doesn't break. There's a whole, one of the evidence they use is this hadith. They say, look, Nabi saw some touched her feet, and they moved back. The Shafi said, well, she had socks on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so going on, this fifth is a very interesting subject. Very, very interesting subject. So, there were, there's space for three graves. Nabi Salasim is buried there, and at his shoulder length, Abu Bakr al was buried. And there was one grave empty. And Aisha al had kept it for herself. Because our belief is, is that the prophets, they are, not, they are not dead in their graves. The prophets, the shuhada, they are alive in their graves. That is why when Aisha al used to visit the grave of Rasulullah she never used to wear hijab. Because that was her husband. And Abu Bakr was her father, her mahram. But when Umar al got buried, then she started putting the hijab on. Because now there's not mahram anymore over there. Um, there's many ahadith of the hayat of Nabi Sallallahu that the earth does not eat the bodies of anbiya, that they are alive in their graves. And uh, there's, how is that life, what is the form of that? Allah knows best. We don't, we don't go there and check. We believe in Iman, we don't have to know the details of every single, the specifications of every single detail of every item. Iman, 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 Allah knows best, what is it? So now, there's two graves. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grave, and at his shoulders, Abu Bakr al And at Abu Bakr's shoulders, Umar al They're facing the Qibla. And before Umar was buried there, Aisha al Arnha reserved it for herself. And when Umar al Arnha was passing away, he sent a message. He said, ask Aisha if I could get buried in that spot. So she says that, Wallahi, I would not have given anyone preference to this spot. But, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, today I will give preference to you on it. But the Sahaba, they had hearts. They had clean hearts, true hearts, honest hearts. Umar al Arnha says, Listen, she might be saying that today because I'm alive and she doesn't want to hurt my feelings. After I pass away, ask her one more time. The kid Umar anhu, And don't tell her Amir al-Mu'mineen is asking, فَنَسْتُ الْيَوْمَ أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ For today, I am not able to, 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 to fulfill the duties of Amir al-Mu'mineen. I'm not Amir al-Mu'mineen anymore today. Don't call me Amir al-Mu'mineen. Tell her Umar bin al-Khattab is asking. And after, I, after my demise, ask again. Maybe today she's shy because of me being alive. Ask her again. If she gives willingly me the permission to be buried next to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa then I'll take it. He comes and she gets buried over there. And another grave is left vacant there. For who? For who? Isa. Isa alayhi Last grave. One Nabi next to another Nabi. Imagine that Nabi that wants to be the Ummati of Muhammad. 
Ya Allah. When he comes back, he's not coming back as a Nabi. He's coming back as an Ummati. Understand how valuable you are. Understand what position Allah has given you. Understand where you stand. We, we've forgotten whose Ummati we are. That even a Nabi is the Ummati. There's no Nabi has been the Ummati of another Nabi. Every Nabi has been a Nabi. They've been, they've been both Nabis of the same Ummah. But no Nabi has been a Ummati of another Nabi. Musa Harun, they're both Nabis of Bani Israel. But their one was not the Ummati of the second. This is the first time in the history that Allah created a one Nabi and He makes him the Ummati of the next Nabi. When He comes back, He doesn't come back as a Nabi. There no Nabi has lived as a Nabi that not lived as a Nabi. The only one that in Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Understand the maqam. Understand whose legacy you are holding in your heart. Understand who, what kind of individual, whose who's du'as, because of whose du'as you have iman in your heart. Because of whose tears you and I are sitting here today. Understand this Nabi. I'm going on, the topic is going to get long. And, uh, okay. Sahabi, just I'll read the hadith to you. He says, Anas radiallahu anhu says, Lama kan al yomu ladi takala fihi rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al madina, ava aminha kulu shayin. When the Nabi of Allah entered Madina, everything illuminated. Falama kan al yomu ladi mata fihi, adla maminha kulu shayin. And the day he passed away, everything darkened. Wamana kas, wamana kodna. Aidina min al-Turab wa inna lafi dafanihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hatta ankarna kulubuna He says, ask us how our hearts were We had to bury Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He says, do you think it was easy for us to bury the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abdi Rabbihi The Sahabi who narrates Adam After Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away He said, Allahumma a'mi basari Hatta la ara ba'da Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahadan He says, ya Allah, make me blind for after seeing the face of Rasulullah sallallahu I do not wish to see anyone else's face. And Allah took his eyesight away. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala who left Madinah Munawwara. He couldn't take it. That once the Nabi of Allah was here, Firaq or Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa You see, we, we, we claim we love Rasulullah. We claim we have the Muhammad. But we, re we really don't. Bilal radiallahu leaves. He goes to Sham. Over there, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa comes in his dream. And says, oh Bilal, come back. You don't visit us. I mean... SubhanAllah, you see, if there was one fadila of being a Sahabi and being next to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wallahi, being there and seeing the day Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away would be the most difficult day for any individual. Bilal Adil Arnu comes back, he sees Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream. He comes back. And as he comes there, they said, Do Adhan Bilal. The way Adhan was called in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I can't. I cannot muster the strength. The Sahaba said, bring those memories back of the days of Rasulullah Sallallahu Bilal when your voice would echo through the streets of Madinah to Munawwara. And Bilal radiallahu ta'ala said, I can't. So they went to the grandchildren of Rasulullah They said, Hassan Hussain, he won't deny your request. You go. You go and ask Bilal radiallahu anhu. We talk about equality. We talk about democracy. This was the first black person given the respect and izzah that was granted nowhere in history was no religion granted respect in history to, to, to people of darker skin colors, skin colors than Rasulullah, than, than the deen of Islam. To the point, subhanAllah, yesterday the lecture in the speech of Isra and Mi'raj, something very beautiful, touched my heart. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, Abu Lahab had a slave named Suwayba, who became, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only breastfed from his mother three or four days. After that, Suwayba breastfed him. There were three women who breastfed Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Harim Masadiyah was the third. Suwayba was the second. And when Suwayba came to tell Abu Lahab of the birth of Rasulullah he was so happy. He had nothing to give her, so he indicated with his finger and he said, you are free. So now people think, oh, look at Abu Lahab, he did this, this is a great thing, you know, he freed a slave. This wasn't the Kamal of Abu Lahab, this was the Kamal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because even the birth of Rasulullah destroys oppression. Even the very birth of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes people free. Even the very birth of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam freed mankind. The very birth before Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even said a word, there is people are already taking the blessings of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Ihsan of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the scholars write many other opinions that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not, he was the king of kings. It was not befitting of him that he would be breastfed by a slave woman. It was be, would be befitting of him to be breastfed by a free woman. Therefore, the woman had to be free. The scholars write many, many things. She was the first woman freed because of Rasulullah and after that millions and millions of people were freed. Going back to Rasulullah 
Hassan and Hussein came, radiallahu anhumah, and they said, Bilal, do you do adhan for us? The way you did adhan for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's time? He said, how can I, how can I deny the request of the granting of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he ascends there, and he starts reading, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. This was the time he would see Rasulullah walk out of his house. But that day there was no Rasulullah walking out of his house. Every single time he would say, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, and the Nabi of Allah would walk out and he would see, he started choking. Because he couldn't, he couldn't buster it anymore. It was the day when he would look onto us, he would say, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He would see the Muhammad Rasulullah in the live flesh walking out. But today he doesn't see that anymore. He began choking and he began crying. Wallahi, in the books of history it is recorded that there was not an eye in Medina that was left dry. There was not an eye in Medina that was left dry. Everyone broke out into tears and Bilal said, I can't stay here anymore because my love and my mahboob and my beloved is not there anymore. We, Wallahi, from just the demise of Nabi Sallallahu we can learn so much. We can learn so much just by the legacy that Rasulullah Sallallahu left behind. How he left the Sahaba, what kind of individuals he left behind. That each this book of Hadith Shamayr, why is it so special? I mean, well, maybe only one person when I was reading the Hadith understood it. But if you actually understand the Hadith, you will notice how each Sahabi, all they're doing is just describing the Prophet. You know, I saw him, he was eating cucumbers. Oh man, he was just eating cucumbers. Oh, you know, I saw him and he spoke. But he spoke very clearly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I saw him, and he was wearing a red sheet, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone was like, really, he wore a red sheet? You know, I want to wear a red sheet too now. They, one of them was like, you know what? I counted the Prophet with white hair on his beard. He had 20 white hair. That's, you know, I counted. I sat there and I counted it. And then I said, you know what? I, you know what? I, I, I saw how the Prophet put Surma in his eyes. He put three on this side and three on that other side. To the, well, there is no person in the history of mankind who has been recorded and his actions have been penned more than Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Get his book of world records should do this. I get the million dollar prize though. <laughs> Whatever prize they have. There is no person in history that has been documented. And why? It's because the Sahaba felt the Iman. You see, the reason you and I don't care is because we haven't had that feeling. We haven't felt that connection yet. You see, for those who attended my Shamal class, now there are some of you guys have attended most of the classes. To you now, Rasulullah is a person you actually understand and recognize. Otherwise, if you don't go through this ahadith and you don't read this, Rasulullah is just a name. But if you go through ahadith, you see, I read about Sunan Abi Dawood in the back of a book. It was reading something very beautiful. It said, Man kana fi had al kitab, ka fi That if you have a book of hadith in your house, it's as if you have a Nabi in the house. Get to know them on a personal level. Get to know who Rasulullah was. We only hear when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi always said to pray Salah. He said, no, get to know who this man was. Al-Mabusari Burda says that I left the Sunnah and I've abandoned the way of the man who would stay in sajda. His feet would swell and he would be, tears would be dropping from his eyes and all he would say is, Ummati, Ummati. He would call for us before we were born. And today we say, you know what, I don't have time for these things. Today, subhanAllah, I mean, it's, 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 it's to read the hadith, to understand these things, to get to know Nabi Sallallahu yeah. to understand his personality, to understand what he's done for us. You see, the Ihsan of Rasulullah is great. To the point that it doesn't end today. Till the when Mi'raj, Allah gave Nabi Sallallahu three gifts. Number one, he gave him salah. Again, 50 salahs brought down to 5 salah. Imagine if you had to pray 50 salah. Every action of Yisrael Islam was ihsan on us. The second was the last ayahs of Surah Baqarah. Was it this last ayah of Surah Baqarah? Who's half it here? I, I'm not half it, but I know the last. What's the last ayahs? Could be the number of The last ayah? The last couple of ayahs. From Rabbana la tuakhidna in the sin of the Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
ربنا لا تؤاخذنا ان نسينا او اخطانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا اسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقه لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا انت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين دعاس even the gift that Allah gave him was to ask to get us forgiven and the third thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was that anyone in your ummah that doesn't do shirk, I'll forgive them. One day they'll enter Jannah. If they just don't do shirk, no matter what happens, one day ultimately they'll enter Jannah. And even there, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi doesn't stop there. He says, I will be waiting at the Hawth of Kothar. I'll be waiting at the reservoir. Allah gave me, Inna a'atayna kal Kothar. What, what is so special about Kothar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that at this time Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi will be standing there. And even there he will be making sure that every ummati of his makes it to Jannah. Every ummati of his makes it to Jannah. There's many, many, many discussions on this. You can go all night long on this. Ba'u ma jha fi mirathi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The inheritance of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what did Rasulullah leave behind? How many followers did he have when he passed away? How many, how many people went on Hajj with him? 10,000. That was Fatih Makkah. Fatih Makkah, 10,000 entered Makkah. 70. The final speech? Yeah. Hadith al Wada. How many were Hadith al Wada? 110,000. In a span of one year, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam jumped one or two years. He jumped from 10,000 followers to 110,000 followers. Fatih Makkah. You see, inna ma'al usri yusra. Some days you think that difficulty is happening. When you lose all hope, don't let go of the hope of Allah because that's when Allah will give you the most. You see, we think Allah will give us the most when things are going normal. No. When you lose hope 110%, that is when Allah is going to give you 500% that time. But he wants to see how long are you going to say Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil wa ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal nasir. The test is hard, but the reward is far greater. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had hundreds and thousands, 110,000 went for Hajj. Imagine how many Muslims were there. Millions. At the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa there were millions of Muslims. In a span of 23, year, 23 years, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa converted millions of people. The first 13 years, he had what? 100 followers, 200 followers? Battle of Badr, 313 followers? Fohar, 1,000 followers? Fatih Makkah, 10,000? Last one, two years, a million followers there. How does it go? No Facebook, no Twitter, no page, no advertisement, no sponsorship, nothing. No collection, nothing. Where did it go? This, well, I was asked to speak on in Islamic Awareness Week one time, and I said, I don't give any evidence on the prophethood of Nabi Sallallahu and his truth besides this one thing. A decade or two, is but a child or an infant in the history of civilizations. And it's just an infant. In a year or two, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought millions and millions of people there. Why? It was his character. He enters Fatih Makkah. When he enters Fatih Makkah, you see, he showed them miracles. He split the moon in half. He made pebbles talk. Water gushed from his fingers. He defeated, angels came and fought in the Battle of Badr. SubhanAllah. They didn't bring him on. 10,000 came with their swords unleashed, unsheathed, and they still didn't bring Iman. The people of Mecca, the Prophet of Allah stood up and said, La tathrib alaykum al yawm. Today I forgive everybody. It was his character that brought, that made them all bring Iman. His mortgages didn't bring, make them bring Iman. His character made them bring Iman. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi didn't teach the Ummah that your mortgages will make people bring Iman. He taught the Ummah that your personality will make people bring Iman. And we've, we've lost the prophetic way. We've lost the prophetic personality. So going on. Now this man who has millions of followers, he must have a lot of money, right? What do we do? We have gifts and we have people who come and present something. Oh, the sheikh is here. And, you know, with thousands of followers, $20 per class, ticket, you know. Imagine how much Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, uh, how much should he have when he passed away? قَالَ مَا تَرَكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا سِلَاحَهُ وَبَغْلَتَهُ وَأَرْضًا جَعَلَهَا صَدَقًا He said, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi left only three things. He left, uh, he left uh, some armor, 
he had a mule and he had some land that was there for Sadaqah. That is all the Bissalah left. He wakes up as he is fainting. He has children, he has family, but he says, No, how much money is in the house? There's some dinars, give everything Sadaqah. وَلَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي كَفِّهِ غَيْرَ رُوحِهِ لَجَادَ بِهَا فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ سَائِلُهُ For those who understand Arabic, they understand the Arabic, they understand the poetry. So he goes on to say, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't leave anything behind. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu says that Fatima radiallahu anhu, I came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. She said, Ya Rasul, Ya Abu Bakr, where is my inheritance? He said that the Prophets, they don't leave any inheritance. You want to have the inheritance of Rasulullah? He said, إِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِّثُوا دِينَارًا وَلَا دِرْهَمًا إِمْ أَنْبِيَاءَ They don't leave any gold, they don't leave any silver, they do leave inheritance. They leave knowledge. And the scholars are the inheritors of prophets. If you want your children to be part of this legacy, if you want your children to be inheritors of the Nabis, and you want your children to have a direct connection to Rasulullah, who becomes a wadith? Who becomes your inheritor? Someone who's directly connected to your father, your brother, your children. Your cousin doesn't become an inheritor, he's too far away. You need a strong affinity to be considered, and uh, to consider, obviously if they're passed away, then it, goes, it stretches further and further away. But in order to be a wadith, you need to have a very strong connection with the deceased. You can't just become a wadith like that. So in order to, if a person is the wadith or inheritor of, the, of a nabi, imagine how strong connection they have with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I will give you advice. Make your children scholars. Make them her father. Wallahi, they're not going to die hungry. Because nobody's nikah can get done without them, no one's janazah can get done without them, no one's aqiqah can get done without them, no one's housewarming, everything, they always imagine every single one. Maulana, a scholar has never died, a Maulana has never ever died of staying hungry. Yes, they died of overeating, blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol, a thousand other things. They've died for, they, died, they died because they ate too much. But they've never died because they haven't eaten enough. Actually, that's what you see Malana, they walk around with stomachs. They say that the, the community follows the Malana, and the Malana follows his stomach. I can say these Malana jokes, you guys can't. I'm from the fraternity. The wiratha of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he left behind. He said that I left behind, I leave behind this legacy. I leave behind this kitab. Give your children this honor. Let them feel the words of Rasulullah. Let them fear, feel the words of Allah's kitab. Let them be able to understand it without a translation in between. The way you hear my English, give them the gift of understanding the kitab of Allah and the words of Rasulullah sallallahu In a way that it, they, can, they can connect with it directly. Again, I'm skipping all these ahadith because we're gonna, we're gonna read them with the barukah, inshallah. The last chapter is Now, we've heard so much about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Tirmidhi ties the last chapter. He speaks about how Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood, how he sat, how he spoke, how he cried, how he slept, how he ate, how he combed his hair, how the shoes he wore, the shirt he wore, how he smiled, the jokes he said, the stories he said. Every single thing Imam Tirmidhi speaks about it. Then Imam Tirmidhi says, just like you, I also have not seen Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But let me tell you, that doesn't mean you can't see him. This was the Muhammad of Rasulullah. Then he said, even those who don't see me physically today, it's still not over, you can still see me in, my, in your dream. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the hadith, this hadith is in Bukhari as well. Man ra'ani, because I don't know, people get, uh, they, have, they have this fever, I call it the Bukhari fever. Unless it's in Bukhari, they don't believe the hadith. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani fa inna shaytana la yitamantilu bi. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, If you see me in a dream, then verily you've seen me. Shaytan cannot come in my fashion. Shaytan cannot come in my fashion. In your dream, if you see that this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes in a disheveled position. He comes in a, uh, a, uh, a not in a good form. That is because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a reflection of your actions. If your actions are bad, 
Nabi Sallallahu will come in a bad form. There was one person I know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi in their dream came and there he was giving the middle finger. He was cursing them in the person's dream. And he went to get interpreted and the person said, you have bad in you. And he said, that's true. He said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bad person. That's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi came in that form. So you don't want Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coming in your dream and curse you off. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had so much muhabbat that he said the legacy doesn't end here. How do you see Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in your dream? Love him. Ulti hi chal chalte hai divan gaane ishq. Ulti hi chal chalte hai divan gaane ishq. Aankhon ko band karte hai didar ke liye. The Urdu poet says that when you love someone, you see, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's the opposite of what happens in reality. If I want to see you, I must open my eyes. But love has, the rules of love are opposite. In order to see your beloved, you must close your eyes. They say that in order for me to see someone, Zayn's already closing his eyes. But you, in order to see someone, you, when you love someone, you have to open your eyes. But when you close someone, you see their beloved. You know, a person asked me, he, I, I met a Hindu on the plane to Qatar. And he said, and we started talking and about religion, this and that. And I started speaking about idols. He said, look, he said, your father. He said, if you want to love him, when you see his picture, don't you love him more? So these idols, they enhance our love. And I said, no. And I said this poem to him. I said, Ulti hi chal chalte hai divan gaane ishq. I said, when you love someone, you must close your eyes to see your beloved. It's because your beloved is not always there. As your beloved doesn't need to be there. But the way to see them, you close your eyes and they become aware in front of you. The same thing with Rasulullah We close our eyes and Rasulullah in our dreams comes. How? Love him in this manner. Love him the way you love sports. Love him the way you love food. Love him the way you love those celebrities. Love the way those celebrities come in your dream. Nabi Alayhi will come as well. But you must love him more than you love those things. They say in the final year of Ahadith in the Alim program that teachers and students both in the first couple of months see Rasulullah in the dream. Because daily, morning, 12 hours a day you're hearing qala qala Rasulullah. 30,000 Ahadith in one year. 30,000 Ahadith in one year. It's not a joke. We did what? 300 Ahadith today? 320 Ahadith today? It's tiring. We did 30,000 in one year. All day, all night, all year is qala qala Rasulullah. Qala qala Rasulullah. And our teacher said something at the beginning of the year. He said, Wallahi, this will be the best year of your life. Because this will be the year you will wake up to qala qala Rasulullah. You will sleep to qala qala Rasulullah. You will think qala qala Rasulullah. The ni'mat of this hearing qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is what the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So going on, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi says many times that a person who sees me in the dream, shaitan cannot take form of them. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story of my, of my teacher that he just heard. You have to snip the camera for that. Because he said not to tell anyone. قَالَ مَنْ رَآنِي فِي الْمَنَامِ فَقَدْ رَآنِي فِي الشَّفَيْنَ شَيْطَانَ لَا يَتَخَيَّلُ بِهِ وَرُؤِيَ الْمُؤْمِنَ جُزْءُ مِنْ سِتَةٍ وَأَرْبَعِينَ جُزْءَ مِنَ النَّبُوَةٍ وعن ابن السعين قال هذا الحديث دين فانظروا عمن تأخذون دينكم تم الدخيل والدعاء إن شاء الله اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته سره اللهم صل على محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وكلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ودخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه كنبيك وحبيبك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه كنبيك وحبيبك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يا رب العالمين forgive all of our sins يا رب العالمين forgive those sins that we have done in the brightness of the day forgive those sins that we have done in the darkness of the night Ya Rabbul Alameen, forgive those sins that we thought that no one was watching us, but Kiram and Katibin were writing them. Ya Rabbul Alameen, forgive those sins of us that we did without your fear. Ya Rabbul Alameen, forgive our parents. Ya Rabbul Alameen, for those whose parents are alive, give them a long life. Put barakah in their life. Put happiness in their life. Ya Rabbul Alameen, make them pleased with us. Ya Rabbul Alameen, for those whose parents have passed on, forgive their sins. Elevate their status. 
Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them reward of this dars. Ya Rabbul Alameen, the scholars that have taught this kitab, Mufti Alauddin, Mufti Wali Hassan, Alam Yusuf bin Nuri Rahimahullah, Alam Anwar Shah Kashmiri Rahimahullah, all the way to Imam Tirmidhi Rahimahullah alayhi, to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them all the reward for the dars that is going on. Ya Rabbul Alameen, this hadith kitab that we are reading, Ya Rabbul Alameen, we were never worthy to read it, we were never worthy to study it. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we were dirty individuals that were reading the pure words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we have read the hundreds and hundreds of characteristics of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rabbul Alameen, instilled these characteristics in ourselves. Ya Rabbul Alameen, turn our lives into the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rabbul Alameen, today the Ummah is in the situation because we have turned away from the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rabbul Alameen, any mistakes that have been made in this dars, Ya Rabbul Alameen, they are from me and Shaitan alone. Ya Rabbul Alameen, any good that has been done in this dars, it is from you, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, always keep us in our entire life in connection with Quran and Hadith. Ya Rabbul Alameen, do not ever take us away from this legacy. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we're not deserving to study or teach it. Ya Rabbul Alameen, but it is your karam and it is your rahmah. Ya Rabbul Alameen, those in the crowd that have any needs, any jayas needs, Ya Rabbul Alameen, fulfill them. Ya Rabbul Alameen, those who have debts on them, Ya Rabbul Alameen, from the treasures of the unseen, fulfill their debts. Ya Rabbul Alameen, those who have their homes on riba, Ya Rabbul Alameen, clear their homes of riba. Ya Rabbul Alameen, those who are sick, give them shifai kamil and daim adil and mustabirra. Ya Rabbul Alameen, those who have fights in their homes, Ya Rabbul Alameen, make their homes lovable homes. Ya Rabbul Alameen, today our homes are like Jahannam. Ya Rabbul Alameen, today people's homes are breaking. Husband and wife are getting talaq. Children are running away from the home. Ya Rabbul Alameen, protect the Ummah, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Allah, protect the Ummah, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, protect the youth of this Ummah. Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them hidayah. Ya Rabbul Alameen, they're losing their Iman. Ya Rabbul Alameen, look after their Iman, Ya Rabb. Ya Rabbul Alameen, every single person that is doing the work of deen, accept the work, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, the, the brothers that have helped organize this Shabir and Dr. Arsalan and Hassan and all those in the Muntazameen and all the people that attended it, Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them reward from your treasures. Ya Rabbul Alameen, those who have any issues at their homes, make it easy at their home. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we know that this Friday, in almost 1400 years, was the first time the Jummah was not prayed in Halab. Ya Rabbul Alameen, the situation of the Muslim Ummah is such that if a dog was hurt or attacked, then thousands of people stand up to protect the dignity of a dog. But the blood of children and the blood of women and the blood of youngsters is being spilled, and no one is there to, to, to cry out for them, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Allah, make the ahwal and the conditions of Syria and Palestine easy. Ya Rabbul Alameen, make the conditions of Syria and Palestine easy. Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them peace. Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them safety. Ya Rabbul Alameen, give them food to eat. Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, give us love in our homes, give us love in our family, give us the ability to act upon the deen properly. Ya Allah, accept this dua, and whatever ajr we have done from this dars, give it to all the deceased and all those who are alive. Ya Rabbul Alameen. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yisifun wa Salaamun Ala Mursaleem wa Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Please, the dinner is there, so please help yourself, inshaAllah. Just give us a few minutes to set up.